Hello, lovely listeners. So today's uh, episode is with the wonderful Chris Berry. And um, I've never met Chris before. This is a, an honor for me to meet him for the first time today. Um, Chris, the little I know about Chris, Chris has had a real hero's journey from what I can gather. Um, come from adverse uh, situations as a young boy, um, gone through some trials and tribulations in his life to where he is today, running his own creative agency um, and a very happy uh, marriage and family life, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't always that way. So um, I'm, I can't wait for the listeners to hear your story, Chris. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing. Great. So could you um, basically give us a, a a bit of your backstory then you know I've, I've learned a little bit from what I saw but if you can talk us through you know sort of what happened what you know what you're um happy to share and um and sort of any pivotal moments along the way where you really thought shit I need to do something different um okay uh, I think with me is a story of really I've never been one to ask for help so all the way through probably from when I was a young age, I went through a bit of child abuse. Um, I had a babysitter who decided that um, she wanted to, and I had a brother, so me and my brother, two years younger than me, would go to this babysitter. And I guess it was only in the last, probably three or four years since I've been remarried was when I decided that people should, or someone should know about this. Mm -hmm. And I started writing a book about all the things that have happened. And this was the part when, I finally admitted it to anybody. I'd never told anybody about it. I'd kept that as something that was inside me that I think started the journey of it's my problem. Even as an eight year old, it was, I'll handle this. I know it's not right, um, but my mum would be, up. I think the typical thing as a child, my mum would be really upset if she knew about this. Yeah. So for her to find out and she doesn't know the full truth yet. It's kind of something I'm leaving for the book, whether that's the wrong thing to do. I'm writing this kind of story as part of my, let's get it onto paper. Let's talk about it. So she's kind of just found out in the last few years that, okay, something went on. Right. At the time, I hid it really well. I kind of knew every time I was going to see this woman that potentially I was going to be touched or made to do things. Um, and I would come away from there and go home and just sit. And it was, it's very strange even now to kind of have a reflection on that of you, why did you not say anything? Mm. And that started, I think, with me a journey of keeping lots and lots in. It's only now that I've started to kind of let the journey, let the, let the, the, the things that happen to come out and talk about them. But I think a lot of those have made me that super bulletproof person I am today. So I kind of got out of that situation that kind of ended on its own natural thing but that woman kind of never got the comeuppance that she should have got right you know? but I don't I don't sit here thinking I wish I could out her or you know she has to live with what she did I don't feel the need of vengeance to kind of go right well, you've got to pay for what you did I never felt that ever um, do, you, that do you ever was, feel like sorry to interrupt but do you ever feel like she could be still doing it to other people and, and therefore? No, I think I was just in a situation where the two of the, the, me and my brother would go there for, for babysitting. Um, you know, she would, I mean, she would make us work, you know, she would make us travel across town to a laundrette carrying stuff. And that's not an issue. I didn't feel that was bad. We'd make us clean the house. But every now and again, she would pull me out of the environment where her, and she had a son who was two years older than us. And I do sometimes wonder whether she was with him doing the same. So, but you know, I'm nearly 50 and I can't kind of sit there and go, I should have done something. No, you know, okay, yeah. I'm hoping that the two of them resolved any issues if they did have any. Yeah, you know, my brother doesn't even know what went on. I've never sat down and said, Why, well, you know, did she? I don't even know whether he had the same. Yeah. We've never sat down and had that conversation. But what it did with me was kind of built a, a part inside me that says, okay this is your situation. This is, you're not a victim. I never felt a victim or anything. I never kind of sat there when I hate her, I'm a victim of this. It was more, this is your fault. Now I kind of have this thing, it's your fault, Chris. 
not a beat myself up inside, but it's your fault. So if it's your fault, get out of it. Don't be a black, don't blame everybody for it. Don't get into that whole kind of, I can't do anything because of other people. I kind of have in my mind now, which was something I got even stronger when I started getting bullied at school. Um, again, I didn't tell anyone. So I was in that kind of hiding position where for two years, my final two years, I was punched every day by um, someone. The guy's now dead, so I've got my kind of, well, you died now. You know, he became a drug dealer and died of a drug overdose. So I have inside of me that, okay, I went through that. Um, I knew every day going to school that I'm going to get hit today. And the two people that were with him would hold me while he hit me, never hit me in the face. He always kind of knew that if he hit me in the face, something would have to come out of it. I guess also maybe one day he was waiting for someone to say something. Yeah. But I never did. I kind of just went, okay. I was very lucky at school. I was quite a good looking guy, very popular. And I think that was his thing was that, okay, you're popular, but you're my, you know, the term, I'm going to treat you like my bitch at school. I'm going to do what I want with you. And if you tell someone, you tell someone, then I'm really going to have a go at you. So I kind of just got used to that, go in, take my, my hit and go home. I never told anyone. And I've since told anyone, tell everything you can if you go to school and something happens you tell people I tell my kids anything happens the smallest thing that you want to talk about you do that hmm. because I didn't for two years I just had this kind of thing like I'm gonna go home I don't want to tell anyone I'm strong enough to get through this and that kind of went in life of I can't tell anyone anything that goes on it's my life I'll deal with it it's it's for me to get myself out of it. And I maybe in a, in a hindsight, my regret is I never told anyone. Um, but, you know, that was just kind of getting to school. And then I wound up at 19, married with a child, uh, a mortgage owner. You know, it was kind of left school, never really a chance to have that big kind of living of anything. I just found myself with a baby, with a wife, with a house and going, OK, now what do we do? And that kind of started the journey of now I want to improve things. I want to always constantly look into work hard. How do we get this living in a house with a very, very, you know, big mortgage? Um, I just come out of an apprenticeship. So we were very new. My wife wasn't working, baby. I could have sat there and gone, Jesus Christ, what are you doing? You've gone from all this, the, this kind of, uh, you could have escaped and lived but you decide to go straight into the marriage, straight into the house at a young age. And it's, I, uh, it's understandable though. It's like that level of security, isn't it? That you were missing in parts of your childhood, you know? But possibly, yeah. I think it was a really quick, you know, it was very much, there's a baby, there's a baby. And I wasn't much up for having the baby, but it happened. Yeah. I, I wanted to run away from it and just be that typical guy who ran away from that responsibility. But then I saw the I saw her pregnant and thought, what are you doing? So I kind of got back into that relationship and decided I'm going to be a father. I'm going to own up to my responsibilities. I'm going to get a house for them. We're going to you know, work hard at this and bring up Daniel with a really, really happy household. Wasn't always great. Dan was probably the one kid that went through all of my journey. Mm. You know, we got married and within two years I'd broken my back. Mm. Um, so I'd gone from managing to get out of my apprenticeship and getting a good job to then finding myself in hospital, having half of my spine removed. How did you do that? It's a crazy story. I was, it was um, the World Cup was in England and no, the Euros. And I was out with some friends. I saw a Coke can. I kicked the Coke can. I went up in the air. I came down. My bum hit the floor of the car park, but my back hit the high curb. Ooh. And rather than go to hospital my friends shoved me in a car and took me home in pain because you don't think oh it's anything serious yeah yeah uh, I waited there but I was on my own no one was at home I was on the floor the wife came home saw me in pain on the floor called an ambulance and the next day I found myself back at home because they didn't x-ray me they just assumed I'd had a drink that day um so I'm on the bed I've got four vertebrae shattered um and two weeks later, I went private where they said, Mr. Berry, you've got four vertebrae smashed and you need to go to hospital quick. 
And that then was the journey of 18 months of recovery, having titanium spine fitted, um, going around with a brace. Um, but I still look back at it and go, well, that that's, an that's another lesson it's taught you. So you kind of think... Don't, um, kick, don't kick the coat can. <laughs> that's the lesson I say to everyone. Don't kick the coat can. Yeah, just keep your feet on safety. You know, you'll be OK. Um, but, you know, you kind of look back and go, OK, that was really bad. But it actually got me out of the job I was in. So I was a printer at the time. And that managed to get me out into another part of an industry, which led to me where I am now. So if you look back, yeah. it was the best thing that happened. It got yes. me out of a, a, a job that nowadays isn't paying huge amounts of money to actually start to learn something else, to go into print finishing, <clears throat> to go into account managing and sales. So I look back and go, well, fabulous. So, you know, all the, each of the things I try to take something positive out of. Definitely, yeah. And this was meant, this, maybe this was, and my wife's quite Christian and very much believes in God has a journey for you. Yeah. Me being an atheist really tries to push against it. But sometimes I have to go, she's got a point. Maybe that was the thing. Kick the coke can. I'll get you out of this kind of job and get you into something that you can progress and learn and become better at. So, and, you know, that then was, I got through all that. And then in 99, the house burned down. So mm. that was at another point where we lost everything. What started the fire? Uh, well, I was in a terrace, a block of six terrace houses with integral garages. And my next door neighbor, a ger ex-German Air Force pilot, was welding um, some motorbikes. So he had oxacetylene welder, uh, motorbikes, a color gas heater, and a petrol can full of petrol. And the flame, boom. Up okay. it went, blew him out of the garage. Um, I was actually at home base, and it's one of the best memories I've got of the whole thing was buying the last tin of blue paint to finish this house that I had spent oh, eight no. years literally <laughs> ripping the house down to then rebuild the house, literally from plastering and everything you can imagine I did to this house. And I had this tin of blue paint, and... I came back from home base and I couldn't get to the house. There was police. So I was, this doesn't, and something inside me said, something's not right. Yeah. So I did this long journey around the block and a guy on a police bike said, no, there's been a fire. Something inside me just was, something's not right. So I did this other journey, parked the car behind these flats, got out the car. And as I'm going towards the house, I picked up the tin of blue paint. No idea why. I walked through the flats and there was my house engulfed in these flames oh god it's coming out of daniel's bedroom it's coming out the roof it's coming out of this house just engulfed in flames so i start running toward the house with a tin of blue paint in my hand and the cop a, a policewoman stopped me and said no you can't go there they've gone to the school where i found out that my wife at the time had only found out about the fire when they bashed the front door down with an axe right or, you know a fireman in full gear the fire was next door and Dan was in the so They didn't even know, right? Okay. No, wow. she closed the windows because she thought the farmer was burning stuff in the fields. Right. And little did she know the house next door is engulfed in flames. Wow. Um, so she had to get Dan out the bar. I mean, I can only imagine how she felt with this you know, axe coming through the front door. Bloody hell. Um, so they went there and then we had this whole period of watching the house burn down. Um, <laughs> where just in everything we owned, just being, you know, lost. And, um, but it, it, the kind of look back on was, well, I never had a chance to clear the garage anyway. So that's done. All that crap in the garage is cleared. Um, the house price went up. So that was great. And I got, well, I, sorry, go on. And when it, we rebuilt the house, the house went up by about 25,000 pounds, which allowed me to move to a better area. Okay, right. There's always a silver lining. Definitely. Love and it. everybody around me increased their insurance because they worked out how bad they were insured. Wow, right, okay. Because I'd always paid for really good insurance. So when they put this house back to being built, the houses next to me had very basic low insurance. And then in the middle, there's this house that had new for old and everything back to how it should be. There was like this castle in the middle of these 
you know, had the beautiful garden landscape front and back. He had these beautiful windows and everybody else had the basic magnolia. So mm. the, the, the lining was get your insurance and you can, it's great. And I got to move to a beautiful um, semi-detached, the other side of town, which really raised the value. So again, I kind of look and go, oh, right, this was Christmas. This was literally two weeks before Christmas Day. So, so where, where did you spend Christmas then that year? The Christmas was crazy. The insurance company, again, because they were brilliant, gave me a check for £5,000. This is 1999. So before the millennium, literally that week, that week, we got a rental place they gave us, check for £5,000. And I'm on but Christmas Eve. I'm at B&Q buying a tree, not really feeling festive, but trying to put a tree up, trying to find any old toys I can give Daniel because he was seven at the time. So he was just, right, just get down, right, anything I could find him. He had, you know, it's like, Dad, what's this? What do you want to do Christmas Eve at Toys R Us? Come on. So there are the things, just trying to, trying to make it a little bit better. Um, so, and we got through it in the end. You know, we got back, the house was fabulous. And um, again, silver linings. So I never kind of sit back and go, oh, woe is me. And this is another thing. And yeah, so it's an interesting time up to, up to 2000. Wow. So what happened next, Chris? Yeah, so that then led, um, that kind of then led into a, a time when um, I decided that maybe the marriage wasn't working. We had this relationship, which led us to then think, well, maybe we need another child. So we were like those couples that are, maybe we should have a baby. So we, 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 we started the process of moving to a new place we then find, found a little bit of trouble having the baby. So we went and got some help. We did, um, some, we did some, some help with the hospital. And then miraculously we found ourselves pregnant. Um, but for me, it was kind of once Ella came along, which was in 2004, um, it was a, she was kind of the thing I needed to maybe to stay. And I'd packed the car so many times to leave. But then it was always the, no, but what, I'll, I'll wait till January, I'll wait till Christmas, I'll wait till Easter, I'll, will they be okay? Well, what about the kids? And I kind of always thought, will they be okay? Will they this? And my ex-wife also had fibromyalgia, so she wasn't working. So it was always, I can't leave. I've yeah. got to do this first. And so in the end, it was a matter of, I would take Ella to dance. You know, so, and again, I look at, it was fabulous. I had this beautiful daughter that is now 17, has danced with the Royal Ballet and is a beautiful dancer, a beautiful ballerina, a beautiful tap dancer and modern dancer who's now at college. And I threw myself into her. I yeah. would take her to dance and the whole kind of, um, okay, I don't have the best relationship with my wife. We're more friends than husband and wife. But I have this daughter that I'm going to take everywhere and I've got Daniel. And so... That led us up to then, I think, 2010, 2009, where I said, like, I'm, I'm out. It's best if I leave. We sell the house. You take all the money. There was a lot of money in the house. And you start afresh with all the money. I'll start afresh. I, can, I have a career that I can carry on doing. I was learning. I had a design agency that I was starting at the time. So I kind of just said, look, take the money. I'll still be the dad. We were still going on holidays together. We were still looking after the kids. We just weren't in a relationship that was one that I thought the kids should see. What was the, was, was there a moment or was it just a, a, a series of moments where you just thought, oh, do you know what, I've just got to go? Or was there a, like a straw that broke the camel's back? Or Do you know what, it was a lot of times, but then all of a sudden it was just the, on our 16th wedding anniversary. And I gave her a card and she looked at me and went, you don't want to give that to me, do you? Right. So we just had sat there and went, no, we kind of just both looked at each other and went, this isn't working. And then the weekend I, I moved out. Um, it was just, we kind of just looked at each other and just went, what are we doing? Yeah. The kid will be better off if we're just apart. We, and so it was no row. There was no other person. You know, it was just us becoming democratic about it and going, okay, let's, let's be co-parenting. Let's, let's see what we can do. And, and we did for years. You know, we did all the way up until um, I didn't date. I didn't. I decided to just be a dad. I had some tattoos made on my arm. One that said 
um, a father first and the other one that has their names on with their birth dates in case later when I forget them, you know, get, get, yeah. get old. Um, but I decided that that was it. I didn't need anybody else. I didn't want a relationship. I was very happy just being a dad. And then that led me up to um, 2014 when I started another business and that was going really well. And it led me to a position where I found myself homeless. Um, I'd got in with a friend. We were going to run a business together. I was putting money into this business. And then I was supposed to move in with him, uh, the farmhouse. And the day I was supposed to move out with him, he cancelled it. He said, no, you can't do it. And I had no money at this time. I would literally put every penny I can into this business. And for about six, seven days, he was paying for me to stay at a hotel. He was trying everything he could to kind of make up for dumping me in this way. Why did he do it? He just said that in the end, it was my mum's decided we can't have anyone at the house. And again, it's my fault. I didn't sit down and have a proper conversation. I didn't sit down and do terms and conditions and arrange everything. I put my yeah. trust in this guy, found myself homeless and thought, what do I do? And then I thought, okay, after the six days, I said, that's it. You're not going to pay for me for another hotel. I'm in charge now. I'll sleep in my car tonight. And I slept in this Avis rental car by a dumpster by the back door of my office that I was renting from a customer. So I slept in his car and to me, it was nothing. I slept in the car was fine. That rolled into 13 weeks. Sleeping in your car for 13 weeks. Car for 13 weeks. Again, no one knew. Everyone just thought that, and even my brother's um, stag do and my brother's wedding, no one knew. Where so were you showering what, and stuff? This was this is the thing that my so the, the the office that I was sleeping outside of, I rented from a client who today is one of my best clients and best friends. And he would leave the office, shut the shut the the the, the big shutters at the front down. I would say, right, I'm working late. I would then go into the, he had a nice bathroom at the downstairs. I would wash in there, clean in there, wash my clothes in there. Then I would turn his heating up and put all my clothes around. There would be like a trolley jack and I'd put clothes over the top of it. And, and then I'd put the heating up and go and sleep in the car. Come back in the morning before he came in to fold everything up and make it all nice and neat. And then at weekends when it was my turn to have Ella, we would drive down to my parents in the New Forest, stay there the weekend. Ella just assumed daddy's taking me to the beach, seeing nan and granddad, it's fabulous. On the Sunday, then I'd get a care package from my parents and I'll oh, take that home with you, take that home. And again, I'd then just go back to, um, my, back to this um, dumpster outside the office with the care package, because most of the week I wasn't eating because I was trying to get money in for the business. I was trying to recoup money back from the business that wasn't working trying to still, you know, I never stopped paying the money to my ex-wife for the kids. Wow. So they got to a time where there was no money. Dinner was a pack of mints. You know, it was, there was days where there was no food. It was just kind of, okay, they need, the kids need the money. She needs the money for the kids. And we're talking 500 a month. Wow. And I'm, I'm every day driving there to pick Ella up still and take her to school and then pick her up and even take her home not telling anyone anything that I'm sitting there or sleeping in a car. Quick question. Yeah. Have you seen Pursuit of Happiness? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I, when I watched that, I, I can completely understand how someone can get in that position. Yeah. I kind of sometimes look back at it and think, well, if you just gone and sat with your parents and told them they would have given you a place. But there was always that goal of, okay, look, you're in a car now, but a couple of weeks time, you could have pick up that client yeah, major deposit. You can go and rent a place, and I just broke it down into small chunks and just said, "You get out, Chris. Don't worry." You know, there were people at times said, "Chris, how can you do it for thirteen weeks?" I would just sit back and go, "There's people that don't even have a roof over their head. They're sleeping in doorways." Yeah, you know, I could change the view every night. I could um, decide to sleep at the beach one night. So I never once felt sorry for me because I had this kind of mobile house. Mm. Um, and it, if anything else, it made me really understand the value of how much I would need to live on if ever it happened to me again. Very, and even now, I'm kind of, I've, I've done nothing in my world that is expensive. I don't want nice cars. I don't want nice stuff. 
I cherish the holidays and the time with people and experiences. And so again, it, to me, it's a silver lining. It's kind of humbled me to what's available in life and what I can get through. What I didn't realize was that at the end of 13 weeks, I'd have a stroke. Oh, That's the kind of bit where if, if anything changed my life and there's a, there's a point in it, <laughs> the back, the homelessness isn't the part that kind of put a, a, a line in the sand. It was the homelessness. Uh, sorry, it was the, the stroke after the homelessness. That's when all of a sudden I couldn't hide it anymore because you know I'm now in a chronic stroke unit in Camberley, which is nowhere near anybody. You know, my parents are in the New Forest. Um, my ex-wife and the kids are in Basingstoke, so we're, I'm, I mean, I'm an hour away, and I'm in a hospital bed with no memory. Um, I'm, I've got this horrible stammer. My, my arm is shaking like a leaf. I don't know where I am. And a woman comes up to me, this nurse, and sits down and says, we just want to go through a few things, name, date of birth, this kind of thing. And she said, where are you living? And I looked at her and I welled up and I just said, I'm homeless. And it was the first time I never admitted. Yeah. I'm and it was the first time when I kind of went, Jesus, Chris, you're an idiot. You've got yourself here. You know, so yes, I coped with it and tried to run a business and tried to be a dad. And but you've kind of now put yourself in a complete mess. And all I kept up was was wondering where my son was because I've been out of the night before and um I just was just sitting there shocked that how the hell did I have a stroke? Yeah, where were you and 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 how did you get to the hospital? Um well the night before, so this is Easter weekend. So I, I was um, just turned 41 and it was Easter weekend and me and my son had been to the cinema and he said, dad, you, look, you don't look too good. You look pale. And I went, yeah, I'm feeling a bit rough. So I dropped the, him off at home with his, with his mum and I drove to the, the A&E at the Basingstoke Hospital. Oh. Walked in, saw this huge queue and went, no, I'm not. You know us men are like, we're like, no, nah, we just, bit, you know, I'll take tablets, I'll be fine. But I looked at it and just went, no I don't sit there so I then left the hospital I drove 45 minutes back to where I, at this time I decided to stay in the actual office and then I, and a beautiful sunny day and I was sitting in the office and I thought no I'm going for a walk get some water I got out the car uh, got out the office locked it up started walking and I remember walking part and I walked to this, this uh, petrol station where there's a Tesco's and a petrol station. And I remember walking past this woman who had a push chair and she had this little girl with her who had this bright red polka dot shirt on. And it's one of these visions of, if I'd been driving my car here after this, I could have killed this poor kid. Mm. Because all I remember was going into Tesco's, reaching in and getting a bottle of water out of this thing and then waking up in the chronic, in the chronic unit. Apparently I'd had a stroke in, as I leaned forward, I had a stroke there. But within three minutes, someone had got the ambulance, got me to hospital. It was that fast that they'd acted quickly, got the ambulance, got me to hospital. Um, and I just think sometimes, you know, you should have stayed at the A&E, Chris. Well, you, know, you could at 45 minutes. I could have done that any moment, smashed a car, kill people. Um, but it was that day of reckoning where now you're going to tell the truth to everybody, you know. And now I'm open to it all. I'm kind of, you know, I'll cry, cry quite a bit when I talk about the story. When I'm writing the book that I'm trying to write of this, I'll read it and I'm crying. It's very cathartic, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. And, you know, and then as we go through, and I kind of look and go, okay, that's it then. That's, that's the end of the thing. I've had the stroke. I've got myself better. Um, and one of the really nice stories, the, the kind of fight back from the stroke was I'd gone to have some counselling and I'd got a taxi into town about three miles away we were and I was in this Costa and I had this walking stick which I've really I've still got it's the memory of I yeah. believe in hospital this walking stick and I'm sitting in this Costa and all of a sudden I went no more Chris stop this and I went and got a bit of paper from the, the lady behind the counter and I wrote on it my name is Chris can I please leave this stick here I'll be back for it and I got her to stick it onto it. And I said, can you just hold on to that? I'll be back. And I walked the three miles home. Took forever. 
I was sweating, feeling really sick. I shouldn't have been out of hospital, maybe. But I walked home and said, that's it, no more. Fight back starts. And that was a pair I said, right, I'm now moving to the new forest where my parents are. I'm going to stay there. My brother met me with a, a Sesame Street ABC and how, how to read and how to count this little kid's Sesame Street book in his usual kind of, come on in, let's, let's get this sorted. And from there, every day I would ride a bike from there to Bournemouth and Paul and back every day, 20 miles in the sun, in the rain. But it was my kind of coming back and getting myself stronger. And I have this thing now with the sea that it's kind of a medicine now. It's, oh, yeah. it's what got me through all this. Mm. And I'm still a guy now who just wants to live in shorts and flip flops and sliders. Yeah. And I'm very happy with that. Um, and then a year later, I've met the woman I've married now. Where did uh, you meet her? Online. Um, one of these crazy Tinder things where I'd met her. I'd kind of gone on it and thought, oh, can I have a date now then? Okay. I've got over the stroke. I've got over all the other stuff. We're, we're on the way up. And I slid on her face. It's beautiful, it's beautiful face uh, image she's got, which was still one of my favourites. And then I deleted the app. Oh. I had this courage, this thing of confidence of, no, she's not interested. She's a beautiful 30-year-old Colombian. What's she going to do with this, you know, knackered old man who's had all this history? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it, you know. And then two weeks later, I said, I'm going to put the app on. So I put it on and it come up and said, you're a match. Ah. And we started talking on, on the end of the first day. We went to WhatsApp. And then for a month, we would talk just on WhatsApp. There was no phone communication. We would just talk, but then we would use the voice and just send little voice messages on WhatsApp until one day, which she still doesn't like, is I phoned her on WhatsApp and she went, you just called me. And I went, yeah, I want to have a chat with you. <laughs> and then she was like, but you called? And she hung up and um, she then flew in from Paris into the UK. We met and we've been together now. Um, we've been married for three years nearly and we've been together six years. But we, we met. I told her I loved her and fell in love with her. So let's move in together. And within a month of me getting the house, she was told she had to move to, to the US with her job. <laughs> Right. So I'm sitting there going, you're joking. I finally found someone. I'm really happy. I've just taken the rent on this house. And she flies to Denver and has to live in Denver. Wow. Fast forward four years. Every month I flew. I flew there every month to Denver for four years. Every weekend, every month, I would have a weekend there to Denver and back um, until 1999 when she finally got a visa to come and live here. You mean 2019? 2019. She finally, in October, yeah, she finally got the visa to come and live here. We'd be, and then, of course, she comes here. We're in lockdown. <laughs> so we can't travel the country. We're just locked in. We've had, so we had five years of pretty much being apart or long distance to then 2019 in October, right the way through to the end of lockdown, we're stuck in a house together. Never lived together. Never had a month together. We were just bang. We're in it. And how did that go? <laughs> amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. I think that distance of being together really made us understand how much we really oh, loved yeah. each other. When we're together, we're in it. We love the company. We've never had a row. Just never have. Um, the age difference, you know, there's 13 years between us. Yeah, but you look young, don't you, for your age? I keep getting told, when they tell them I have a 29 year old son, they're like, you're joking. Yeah. Yeah, so and I look at it, it's great. I had, you know, I had this young, I was a young father at 19, 20, with, you know, I've just got to keep the baby alive. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to do any learning or teaching here, just keep the baby alive. Then I had this second one, early 30s, which was all about, okay, just be a dad again and just really be a good parent and, now that I'm having a baby close to 50, which is due to so this third one's due in January. How does um, that feel, by the way? I know you yeah. absolutely love your wife and everything else, so it's different, but it must be daunting. Um, it's what made it daunting as well. This was, we, we went through IVF for this child. Um, and then in January, when we, the day we were going to find out if we were 100% pregnant, because we'd had this, the, we did the, the pee on a stick, 
we sit down with this lady in the IVF clinic and she says, I'm not happy with this. So all of a sudden I'm like, oh, come on, Chris, just do something simple, please. No, no. So we get rushed across London to find out that they want to abort the baby. So I've then all of a sudden I'm thinking, no, be strong now. Tatty's in tears. Tatty, I know she's absolutely in tears. Then she's about to lose the baby. Four days we're in hospital in St. Thomas's in London and it's we're taking the baby. We're not sure we're taking the baby. It's in a dangerous place. So it, then I'm they took her down to theatre, opened her up to do an abortion and then went, no, we're not. Pulled her back out. So we had this huge kind of emotional thing of blimey, they're taking my baby. And that, then they she's got I went home on the Friday thinking I'm going to come back on a Saturday. My baby's gone. Yeah. To find her come out of they wouldn't let you near anyone because of covid to find that she's in recovery and not had an abortion and she's panicking in shock going chris i don't know am i pregnant am i not to then go on to the tuesday after where they they brought the specialist in he went no everything's great you had a twisted uterus go home so so but what that did just i managed that in a way of there was no panic. It was, this is nothing compared to all the other stuff I've been through. I had this bulletproof mentality of, we'll be fine. We'll get through this. So all my job was then was to look after Tatiana's needs at the time, whether it was emotional needs, whether it was physical of being there just for a hug, just to get her the stuff she needed. And that then was, we got through that. And now we've got a baby who's 28 weeks, we're in 28, 28 weeks into the pregnancy. She's doing fabulous. I have a beautiful girl called Rosie when she's born in January. Oh. And everything's fabulous. You know, baby shower next weekend and then Christmas is coming. So I kind of look at it and go, well, now I am bulletproof to anything that can come our way. And I just don't have the ability now to ever get down and panic and worry or think the world's going to end. I think each of the different things that come through have just taught me an extra strength have just given me the, the tools to be able to handle with anything. But also the negative side has made me really kind of critical of anyone who gives up or quits or moans about little tiny things. I sometimes sit there and go, oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that maybe is a slight negative of my personality is sometimes I just sit there and go, really? When yeah. someone moans, it's like, really? Yeah. yeah. I get that though. I get that. Yeah, I can. I mean, I've not had the life threatening things that you've had. Um, but I've, I've had enough terrible times in, in my life and, and, and all the rest of it. And I'm the sort of person that will just pick myself up and get on with it, you know, yeah. eventually. It might take me longer sometimes or whatever. And I've got that in me. Oh, fuck's sake. You know, yeah. man up, come on, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, however, everybody's on their own journey and yeah. everybody's here to learn their own lessons. And, and I know you're, atheist you, you said earlier and your wife's very catholic uh, sorry christian um it, it's interesting because my partner um he's not he's not atheist um but he's very left brain logical engineer kind of guy and i've introduced because i'm very spiritual so i've introduced that and he's been open to it you know not yeah. everything, not everything at all but he's now meditating and stuff like that, which is really helping him on a mental health level, you know, anxiety yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So as you, have you had the same influence from Tatiana? Oh, I think I'd started that before Tatiana. My favorite saying is that, um, from the Bible is, um, you have not because you ask not. Um, so for years I would, you know, have these kind of sayings from the Bible. I did RE at school and loved RE. Um, I loved the Bible. Even now in the summer, we'll sit out in the garden, have a tea, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, and I'll read the Bible to her. Okay. And we'll read different books about different sayings and psalms and say, uh, uh, parables and things. And I've been to church with her. I think the church is a magnificent place for community. I just have don't, I just, I think I'm very much, you know, I hate the Catholic side where it's very much yeah. burning hell, blah, blah, blah. I hate that. Yeah, I love the message of the Bible, the, of Christianity, especially about, you know, helping the community, being together and having the faith that as a community, you can protect, protect the people that are vulnerable and build something. Um, I just don't believe in a deity. I think that comes through of I don't need anybody there to protect me. Whereas 
Tatiana sees God as that person who is there to look after her and will guide her on a journey to where he thinks she should be. But part of me can sit back and go, well, the stuff she says about, you know, Chris, there's a journey to get you somewhere. You know, right now I'm looking to start a charity for young men to help get them into a place where they dream again, where they think they can get through any crisis, where they don't have someone saying, yes, you can do that, rather than in an environment where they are, who do you think you are? Yeah. You know, you're never going to get that job. You're going to be what your dad is and your dad's granddad is and blah, blah, blah. I want to create something that if it means paying for a kid to get to college because he thinks he never can, or a suit for an interview, maybe that little bit that Tatty says is that this is where you were meant to be. You were supposed to go through that suffering to have the strength to go, right, now you can get other people to do things. Totally. And part of me looks at it and goes, that would be fabulous. If I could quit my job tomorrow, I'll run the agency, create a charity that put a thousand kids through college and got them into a, amazing careers and mo- built amazing men that had respect for themselves and women and kids and family that would be amazing that to me you know we're, we're, we're trying to do charitable things all the time and that's what we're we're looking to do more the next few years so if that's what going through everything was for then i'd do it again and also i mean and i'm sure tatiana might have alluded to this um you know the the, the breaking of your back um, could have been a whole lot worse. You know, luckily you were able to get surgery eventually, which put you back on your feet. The the stroke, yes, okay, you're in a bloody hospital and you decided to leave that hospital. But if you'd have stayed in the office, you might not be here now. You decided to take that walk. And yeah. luckily there was an angel looking after you that day, got that ambulance yeah, really maybe. quickly. So, you know, I'm a massive believer in everything happens for a reason. People come into your life for, there's a classic saying, isn't it? A reason, a season or a lifetime. Sure. And, you know, and Tatiana, you, you, for whatever reason, reinstalled Tinder two weeks later and bang, there she is, you know. Yeah. And it's all these little things that, yeah. we, can, that we can ignore um, and not see as the hand of God. Now, I, I was raised a Catholic, not particularly practicing. I don't believe in the Catholic religion at all because of what you just said and, and all the other stuff that's gone along with it. Um, and I, I, I actually wrote a, lot, um, a song because I, I was uh, in a band years ago and I wrote a song called Twisted Lie which was about the Bible being one big fat lie. I just thought, yeah, well, but it wasn't really about the Bible. It was more about the Catholic stuff. And and then losing my dad really sort of accentuated my search for something, if you like. And there there was always that spirituality inside me, but I was a a closet spiritual person for a long time because being an ambitious go-getter, whatever, you know, I'm not supposed to be spiritual, am I? The two didn't seem to go hand in hand. So I was very much in the closet for ages. And then, <laughs> and then eventually had the, the balls with a, a, a yoga teacher of mine who became a bit of a mentor to, to embrace it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that in there because I don't think you are atheist in terms of the fact you're reading the Bible and stuff. Um, you've got that belief in those stories I, I and, and they resonate, don't they? But I think with the thing is, every time I've gone to church with Tatiana, I always thought I can take God out of this mm-hmm. and nothing fails. You know, if anything, the one person in my life that's, of all the things I've gone through, Tatiana is the kind of one person that came in and was just, she was the shining part. She's the one that's never, ever doubted what I want to do, never says you can't do that. She's the one that made my agency, um, what it is today the agency is named after her you know it's called tic tick creative the tic stands for tatiana's in charge yeah <laughs> because she and in a way she is she's the one that's every day inspires me just to get up and be better i have no issue getting up i have no issue being energetic and everything else but she kind of puts that in the back of me where you can't fail whatever you do you're never going to fail it she makes you um just with her presence and whether it's her Colombian side or her Christian side, just every day you make you want to be better. And that I owe a lot to her. 
you know, if there's a time, any time I get a little bit in my head where I kind of maybe have some doubt, she just knocks that out of me so quick. She just says, what are you talking about? And I go, yeah, you're right. And she'll just keep my direction going. And every day I want to just be better for her, just to go, right, I'm really going to prove you that I'm going to some crazy today. And she's brilliant. She just makes things. And right now she is this kind of bouncy puppy waiting to have the baby. Um, you know, she's this kind of very excitable, looking forward to it. Um, and when the baby's born, I'm, I'm sure she'll be an amazing mum, which is kind of, well, for me, will be that icing on the cake. It's kind of almost the journeys then. Because I always said when I was writing, when I started writing this book, I really didn't need a finishing chapter. Mm. Kind of need that. And then the baby was born. But I kind of in my head go, oh, then what's going to happen? You're going to have the baby on a plane or something because nothing's going to be simple. You know, I kind of expect non-simplicity in life. Um, so for me, yes, I, I, not, I guess I'm not the complete um, atheist, 100% what you define an atheist. I just don't believe in a God or have a need for a God, but I do love the message. Okay. All right, cool. Well, that's, that's good enough. Um, yeah. Okay, well, Chris, it's been an absolute joy um, listening you. to your story and incredibly inspiring I know you've the, the theme that sort of runs through it for me is you've been a bit like oh for god's sake you know if only you'd have asked for help or if only this if only that but you were meant to do what you you would you, that you did do because a it's created the Chris of today b yeah. b somehow that led you to Tatiana as well and but also you now got this bigger vision, bigger than yourself in terms of wanting to help guys, you know, um, to be the best versions, regardless of their situation, regardless of yeah. their circumstances. So all of that is amazing. And there are some people that would go through what you went through and would be on their ass and they'd mm -hmm. be a victim. And you're not, you're, you're very much a survivor. You're very much, you, you've got this entrepreneurial spirit. You've got this massive love um and you want to share it and you want to make the world a better place so awesome. I applaud you for that um and I always like to uh, ask my guests if any sort of pearls of wisdom or anything you would like to share with the viewers um because you know this this podcast is all about people not settling for mediocrity so anything you'd like to share at the end um the, the first line in my book is patient is patience is a virtue <laughs> I don't know where, it, where who told me, but I've lived in it since I was like 10. Um, and I think too many times when we face something that we do think is huge, we want to bash away and fix it straight away. Mm. And sometimes we should just sit back, break it down into smaller chunks, and then have a bit of patience. Not, you know, we just want to fix everything like that. We want to just kind of, okay the homeless thing taught me that okay you're in a car let's break it down you're safe let's think about the, the the little steps to move through to the next thing and i think that's what we're missing at the minute sometimes we just don't have that patience to kind of go okay a little bit at a time and i'll go little steps and i'll get back fighting that way i kind of take the overwhelm out of everything and because nowadays we live in this kind of throwaway world where everything's quick it's urgent just sit down, tuck a cup of tea and think about it and plan yeah. it and patience. Patience, yeah. That's definitely something I've had to learn over the years. So very, very wise words. Um, if people would like to get in touch with you, Chris, what's the best place for them to go to? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn um, or I do have a, um, my Instagram page is um, Tick Creative UK on okay. Instagram. Cool. Uh, TIC Creative UK. Um, yeah. Me. Cool. I'll put that in the show notes anyway, so people can. Lovely. Thank really you. Easy. And well, thank you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your inspiring. I enjoyed story. it. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much.